Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. It's the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. My name is Sean Hurley. I am not the host you are used to seeing or hearing here <laughs> on the podcast, but that's because we have a special edition of the podcast here today. We have a lot of our regular hosts here, but on the other side of the table as guests, that's because we're talking about something that I think has literally been a topic of conversation for years now on the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, and it's finally going to happen. And that's Cape Epic. It's an eight day mountain bike stage race in South Africa. And quite a few of our hosts and their teammates are going to be competing. So we'll talk about all things Cape Epic today, uh, race preparation, equipment, expectations for how things are going to go. But let's start by talking about the race itself. And I'm going to turn it over to trainer roads, Rob Hobson, who is a South Africa based uh, cyclist, and I think knows the course and knows the event pretty well. So Rob, Welcome to the podcast. Let's hear a little bit about what we can expect from Cape Epic this year. Thanks. Um, pretty cool to be on a podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah, Cape Epic, um, one of South Africa, one of the world's, I would say, hardest mountain bike stage races. So it's a marathon event. Wait, um, it is. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Nate's out. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's an eight stage uh, stage race. So it's consists of a prologue and then seven stages. And the stages generally they start in 2004. In 2004. Um, and it's, yeah, eight stages taking you around South Africa, mainly the, the Western Cape. Um, some of the toughest trails, toughest routes, a lot of elevation. And generally, people come out with a pretty good story. <laughs> and what kind of what kind of terrain is it? Technical racing is it? Um, is it relatively mountainous? What what can we expect from terrain in the actual race? So it's definitely changed over the years. It used to be a lot longer stages, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it is a marathon event, so it was a lot longer stages, less technical. But as sort of as we've seen the XC scene sort of grow to more technicality, guys running more suspension, the race is sort of followed in suit. So it's yeah, it's you're climbing mountains. There's lots of rocks. There's a lot more single track than there used to be. There used to be mainly Jeep track. Um, yeah, so it's it's definitely not for the average rider to just sort of go and ride. Um, you really have to have ridden a mountain bike and have at least some level of skill to, to really get through and for sure fitness. They knew Nate was coming. That's why they changed but, it up. <laughs> yeah, how technical is technical? Because we should talk about this because I was in South Africa in January and all the riders were like, oh, we're doing tech stuff. And then I was there with Conrad Stoltz, who is from also from our area. And he's like, it's not technical. So but what, uh, what is it? To be honest, Conrad is a pretty skilled rider. <laughs> I mean, seven times, <laughs> it's terrible champ. So um, if you were with Conrad, I think you've got more than enough skill to, to take it on. He's no, I'm not coach. at Conrad's level. He was just saying <laughs> the trails in that area for Cape Epic aren't any harder than the ones in our area in Reno. This kind of like regular riding where you, we, we go to Canada and Can yeah, it's not, it's not BC. Canada it's is insane. Definitely not BC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, like, uh, Denver, like Colorado area harder than Reno too, in my opinion. Um, mm. I, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm banking on at least that it's not that hard <laughs> no, it's, when you're it's... fresh and you know when you're fresh but I, <laughs> <laughs> but i guess after a few days i mean like especially looking at this year's roots um it's pretty unrelenting i mean every year it's unrelenting but yeah <laughs> it's kind of there's no real give point where you can kind of take it easy because it's besides the climbing that a lot of the sections of this year in cirrus are, are, are pretty rocky um mm -hmm. so it, it's also a case of kind of if you aren't super skilled, you can end up causing yourself a mechanical or a puncture, which is something people try to avoid. But I mean, the terrain is, is, is harsh. It's, it's rough. Mm. But like you said, yeah. it's not downhill crazy. It's, I would say, and definitely not XC level hard. It's, it's marathon. It's, I would say it's, I don't want to say advanced marathon, but it's tough marathon riding. Hmm. Hmm. And you said it, one word you used was unrelenting and looking at the, the course profile and just the, um, the parkour of the race, it's eight days with no rest days. It starts with a prologue and then it's seven consecutive brutal stages, which I think is a hard thing to really anticipate in training or even preparation if you've never done anything like that before. So I think it'll be exciting to see how certain of our teams pan out for the, uh, course <laughs> have of the any race. of us done, have any of us done <laughs> anything like this before? Sophia, you're Sophia has. Maybe you've done the, no. is the stage race in Israel? Yeah, but that was like a three day, four day stage race. And that was 
it was hard. It was uh, mm. the starts, I think, for me were the hardest. But uh, yeah, I'm nothing this long. So I'm in for an adventure, Wait, that's for sure. Why, why were the starts the hardest? It was. So my partner, Rose, she does not like mass starts. So we actually would fall back substantially, even on the stages that we would start first because we were leading the women's race. Um, so you kind of were doing a 10, 20 minute effort at the very beginning that you really shouldn't have had you like been more aggressive and had your elbows out. So it took us until the last stage to kind of get better. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it's chaotic. It's a lot of people going together. S Sophia, I can do that. We can, we can we can mix it up i feel totally comfortable being in a group of mountain bikers and i'd actually rather be at the front i mean we should talk about can we i don't yeah. want to interrupt i Drive it's it, been Nate. a while i'm so excited <laughs> sean can i go for I have it thoughts Nate. in my head can you, I just you are say in the things? driver's seat okay the first race is a prologue stage and the prologue is about an hour long and it is mm -hmm. around uh, the university there. There's one very technical section called plum pudding it takes about a minute to get down. People crash on that thing and you can actually end your race on the first day. But if you go slow, maybe you lose 15 seconds over a 35 hour race. Um, not a big deal or maybe 30 for some people on this call, <laughs> but based on what you do on that first day is gets you get seated in different start groups. So there's, I think there's two groups or is there three? Do you guys know? Uh, I, think uh, I don't know this. Yeah. Typically it's been three, right? I don't know this. Yeah. I wonder this year since it's smaller mm -hmm. than it's been in the past since there's less entrance. Yeah. yeah it'll okay. be interesting. Uh, go, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, no, I was just saying it'll be interesting because I know there's a UCI pro men's start that's separate from, then it goes A, B, C, I think normally. But mm -hmm. with the, the, I mean, event being smaller, there might be only go UCI men and then AB um, to split it. In. Or maybe they'll make more groups to kind of keep gatherings to a limit or as limited as possible. I don't know. Either uh, way. Can I jump in really quick? You could totally jump in. That's the voice of Rousseau. Uh, we should, we should, uh, we should introduce that, how it's about right? to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Let's, <laughs> let's introduce our, our teams and all of our competitors. It is a team race. I'm not sure if we mentioned that. So we have two person teams <laughs> yeah. and it's essentially like a team time trial. Uh, Jonathan and I were talking about this yesterday. If, if your teammate, you can't leave your teammate behind, you need to finish together and it's cumulatively timed. So Sophia. it really is a team effort throughout the, <laughs> the course of the race. So yeah, let's introduce each of our teams, um, you know, we've had some life changes in trainer road. So it's not the teams that we had originally talked about a few years ago, but I think we are going to have some really exciting competition and some interesting yeah. team dynamics here. So our first team are, is two trainer road, uh, support employees, Rob and Russo. So why don't you guys introduce yourself, talk a little bit about how you guys envision racing together and just any kind of experience that you have, um, on the, when terrain. you introduce yourself too. Name and walk KG. Let's be real. That's what yeah. we're interested in here. <laughs> are, we allowed, are we allowed to use Zwift what KGs? <laughs> I don't know what word you just said. We just bleeped it out. Uh, the, the schedule broke up there. So, um, Rousseau, uh, do you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, yeah, sure. So, I'm uh, Rousseau Becker from uh, South Africa. Um, started with uh, Trainer Road only a couple of months ago, and yeah, I would say two or three months ago. Um, and it's been really exciting. Uh, last couple of months. Um, I was actually entered for Cape Epic last year, my first one, and then uh, it got canceled. So it was great. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and yeah, with uh, things obviously being quite uncertain, we weren't quite sure if this year would actually go ahead. I think it only got to go ahead about a month ago. So we pushed that entry on to next year and we kind of just said, we'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, this opportunity came along. Um, yeah, so I'm 22. I'm busy finishing up my marketing degree and I yeah, started work for Trainer Road a couple of months ago and then I like to ride my bike. My, so we yeah. just want to know the walk, KG. <laughs> 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 um, I think it's around five and a half. Around five uh, and a half. Okay. That's fast. Right. That's very fast. Yeah, that, that's fine. That'll do. <clears throat> yep. Rob? Um, I'll do that common intro, uh, intro. Uh, i'm rob <laughs> rob hobson uh born and raised in stellenbosch where a lot of the epic stages come through it's mm -hmm. been on my list to do epic for a while every year it's it every year my birthday is on an epic stage uh in the month of march and it's like i've always wanted to do it but anyway it's jumped to the watts per kg <laughs> um currently i'm sitting on like 5.6 but i'm a pretty light rider so i'll take long climbs any day over 
short, punchy race starts. <laughs> What's your weight? Something, something tells me you guys are going to do okay at this race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I mean, Rousseau and I are both, I mean, both local. We both live pretty close to each other and we've, we've done quite a few stage races before uh, together. So, um, yeah, but shorter stage races. Um, but I think we've both done Cape Pioneer, which is another stage race in South Africa, which is also seven days. It's far more, it's super scenic and, and not as hard as Epic. I mean, I still I haven't done Epic, so I don't know, but it, yeah. it's a pretty sick, sick uh, race. So you, um, Rob, you also race for the national, the South African national team as well. You've represented them at world championships. In fact, you just did in Elba, right? At Marathon world champs. Yeah, I would like to say I represented them, but I don't know how how much justice I did to the representation. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, yeah, my my things kind of switched up after giving up being given an opportunity for Epic, so I kind of adjusted things, and um, unfortunately, it didn't end as I would have liked it to end. But now I'm sort of set on Cape Epic for now, and like push for the rest of the season to really make it a solid race. Nate, imagine if we had kept Chad in, but then just paired Rousseau or Rob with Chad. <laughs> that would Chad been, would just be like, would, push me. <laughs> <laughs> would have been the worst experience. Uh, you know, of course, Chad's injured. That's why he's not able to do it either. He can't get a, he can't figure out that TFL injury he has. So, but mm-hmm. yeah, that would have been hilarious. <clears throat> you All right, so fast. you guys have, you guys have been racing up until recently. So you're in pretty good form too. Is that accurate to say? Uh, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm going pretty well at the moment. Um, awesome. Kind of like last year was difficult and weird for everyone and kind of was a big shock to get back into things at the beginning of this year. But uh, it's gone, yeah, I would say, it's got picked up nicely and I think the timing for Epic came in pretty well. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right, let's go to team number two or team B. It's referred to here on my uh, my spreadsheet. Brandon <laughs> yeah, and Jonathan. Exciting, yeah, we don't have exciting we're... names like Thunder and Honey. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, that Jonathan, why don't, why don't you introduce yeah. yourself? We're not familiar with uh, Coach Jonathan Lee here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, I, I'm Jonathan Lee, and I'm about four point. I'd say I'm a strong and comfortable four point eight watts per kilogram right now. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm at, Brandon. And some people have met Brandon before on the podcast, possibly. They've heard us talk about you before, for sure. So, yeah. Brandon, go ahead. Yeah, so I am uh, Brandon Need. I am the the chief operating officer here at, at Trainer Road. And my watts per kg are a measly uh, about 5.1 right now. <laughs> Compared to these Oof. two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Robin Rousseau. Yeah, so Brandon and I are, like, close-ish. But if we're going on a climb and the steeper the climb gets, Brandon will get further and further away from me. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, that's uh, yeah, it's a concern I have. And you guys train that's together awesome. fairly frequently off road too. Is that right? Yeah, we have, we've ridden together if, at some times this year, but we're both dads and we both have, you know, uh, yeah. demanding jobs. So we don't, we have not ridden together much at all prior to this mm-hmm. enough to kind of know, like, I feel like I know when Brandon would need to back off the pace on a descent. And sure. Brandon probably knows when he'd need to back off the pace on the climb. I feel like yeah. we have that, that part at least sorted, but that's about okay. it. Yeah. How about our last team, uh, Nate and Sophia, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? <laughs> yeah. Go Sophia. Cool. Um, I'm Sophia gomez and I think I'm going to go conservative on watts per kg and put me at 4.9. And I'm only saying that because I took a week, <laughs> a week off the bike of the bike last week as I had some stitches on my kneecap. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm really excited to get down there soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sophia, how many national championships do you have? Five, I think. Like you got to count, right? Uh, for <laughs> Argentina, right? Yes. Yeah. And then how many Olymp- as well? How many Olympics have you been to? Just one. Just one. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome, though. She is the most accomplished racer here, and yeah. uh, pretty excited to have her as my teammate. I am Nate. Uh, probably you know me. I am. <laughs> A generous 4.2. <laughs> was that 3.2 was... or 4.2? 4.2 maybe okay. at sea level. Generous. I don't know. I've had a lot of life stress lately. I lost like 10 pounds on not on purpose and I haven't been training and stuff. So it's going to be hard. Uh, <laughs> Sophia, how many hours would you say we've ridden together? <laughs> None. <laughs> Which honestly, I am, I am so amazed that 
even especially when COVID happened, we're like, okay, we're going to be able to, you know, have time to train together and our schedules once again, never lined up. And uh, yeah, I think the first two days are going to be a pretty big learning curve of learning how to ride together and picking up, you know, like you'll know when I'm hurting on the flats, because that's actually what I'm the most worried about is when you're there rolling no coal. <laughs> Sophia, there are no flats. Have you seen the profile? Um, <laughs> there are no flats. There literally are no flats. Oh, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. Yeah, we'll come across flats. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I do want to say, I remember, was it in 2019, I was having a conversation with Jonathan and he's like, oh my goodness, Nate has this crazy idea. He wants to do Cape Epic. He wants to do it with me. I said like, no way. And I was like, hey, if Nate wants to win co-ed, like I'm in, you know, and then that's mm -hmm. kind of where it all started. And then Jonathan went from saying, there's no way in hell I'm racing Cape Epic to here we go. You're flying out Monday. <laughs> yeah, so that's, so Sophia Amber, had, gonna... Amber announced that she is going to have a baby and I just felt very happy and everything was good. And the question was asked at the wrong time. Cause I said, yes, cause <laughs> it was happy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Sophia and I are racing co-ed. Um, so that's his own division. And I thought there was a chance because in January I was like 370 FTP and I was light and stuff. And I'm like that was, or yeah, 370, I was on track to do a good job. And, and there's another team there, the Starks who are super fast. It's kind of like Sophia I, racing with Keegan. Like they're Nate, to, pretty To jump on that, um, Sebastian Stark and Laura Stark, they were actually, I've actually partnered with Sebastian for quite a few races. He's quite a strong German rider. Yeah. Hmm. So and that's like pretty yes. much cleaned up in every COVID race they've done. Um, it's You're like not Sophia helping. and Keegan. Shush. I'm sorry, I'm sorry but he, he is pretty strong. <laughs> but things happen, right? Is how uh, strong is Laura? Um, she's pretty. I, I can't. Like, I can't really. She's pretty strong. But to be honest, like Sebastian, we race together, and he's. I don't know at present. I think I spoke to him like a month ago, but he's he's very strong. Um, so if you know the whole COVID kind of teamwork of whether it's up to your pulling and pushing that kind of a situation, um, whether it's Sophia pulling and pushing you, I don't know. Yeah. But, Sophia, so. do, you, do you prefer me hanging onto your Jersey or do you just want to push me with the hand? <laughs> you, you can just grab to my saddle. Okay. <laughs> or did you get the toey? That's a, that's all we need. She can tap, she can stash it in her Jersey and then toss it out to you. You can hold right on. Mm -hmm. Do you know about Toey's Nate? Did you miss that? We, we made a joke about you on the podcast. I don't know. No, if you, you sent a meme towards me with my picture yeah. on it with a toe. toe so <laughs> thanks. Yeah, John. yeah. Yeah. Love you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hold on. I think that we all just need to like, uh, like elephants in the room, like what we're most concerned about with this race. Cause yeah. Brain um, injury. That's yours. Nate. <laughs> oh, no. Crashing concussion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like it, the, the fatigue part is the big thing for me. And it's not, it's like fatigue adds up. It's cumulative mm -hmm. and it compounds also when you're talking about day after day, you do kind of hit a point where you're kind of just down at your knees and that's just what you are. But that's when you make the silly small mistakes, you know? Yeah. And one of my main concerns has been like this, the, just the upper body stuff, not necessarily upper body strength, but fatigue resistance of your arms and your hands and your wrists hands even just getting blisters right and then like you get a blister then you hold your hands different or bars differently. John, like crash did, did i hear yeah. you i wanted to save this for this but did i hear you're not going to wear gloves uh, i have not been wearing gloves for like months leading That's, up to this yeah that is in sophia oh no in the race i'm wearing gloves i haven't okay. been wearing gloves leading up to it uh, intentionally like to day, try to get i don't wear gloves right now either like I had like, I, I always wear gloves and I had like wonderfully soft baby hands and they would just get torn <laughs> apart by this race. So I have not been doing that. I've been doing like full Rocky Balboa, like in between breaks with work. When I go out for lunch, I'll go out and I'll move cinder blocks as we're landscaping in our backyard, just because my hands get rough and tough that way. Like they're tough now. They're good. And I think we're okay, but that's a big concern because mm. I, that's what happened at single track six. I got a blister. I don't know what happened right? Cause it was that bad of like a head injury. But I know that that race, because of those blisters, I was holding my bars differently all the time to avoid the discomfort and pain. I feel like I have more grip on my bars. Right. That was also a very rough, very like, you know, that's proper yeah. BC gnarly terrain, but still I've been taken out by less last time John, Nate and I rode together. I got taken out in a mud puddle. Like <laughs> I thought it was straightforward. So, you know, John, didn't you, uh, use brand new gloves though that you've never used before at that BC bike race? No, um, they weren't brand new. Uh, and I'd used them before, 
but yeah. they, they weren't the best gloves basically. So mm. yeah, they, they were, the palms were through too fast. So they look cool though. I mean, that's what really matters, right? <laughs> Let the pro go slow. So <laughs> yeah, but that's my biggest concern. Uh, but I, I like, it's just making a silly, like a, a silly mistake being much bigger because of fatigue. <clears throat> yeah. I'm worried about that. And I know for you all in Reno too, training, especially outdoors this year has been kind of hindered by the smoke. So I'm wondering if that's adjusted your approach to the race or changed kind of how you're thinking about coming into this, especially with the technical demands of the race. Yeah. I feel Brandon, do you feel, how do you feel about that? Like, do you feel technically unprepared because we have not been able to ride outside for months? To an extent. Yeah. Um, John and I had planned out a whole week training camp where we were going to go in and essentially try to replicate Cape Epic as much as we possibly could. Um, John, which spent... is dumb. <laughs> <You guys> we <know. laughs> were doing Cape John... Epic altitude on only single track. It was like, it's, you Sounds guys are awesome. blessed not to do it. Yeah, no, it was good. So, uh, John basically spent way too much time mapping out all these different courses that even the profiles themselves looked like every stage of Cape Epic. Um, so we had plans to do that. And then the smoke rolled in and really never let up, um, until fairly recently. Um, so yesterday, fortunately, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, fortunately I was able to find a bit of a break during one other, um, week leading up to things and was able to get out and do three back to back to back four to six hour mountain bike rides, almost all on, on single track or, especially rocky things, um, just to kind of get a little bit more of that feeling of what that, uh, upper body demand is going to be like, and what some of that residual fatigue is going to be like. So based on mm -hmm. that, I, I feel pretty, pretty prepared, prepared for things. Um, certainly more prepared than Nate. Um, so <laughs> that's good enough for me. Zing. <laughs> It's going to race into fitness by day seven. Yeah. He's going to be flying. We're, we're going to win the last stage. We're winning the last stage. <laughs> there we are. Actually, I think the last stage is, is that the one that has like Nate, I thought of you and I saw this profile, which by the way, next week we'll have a podcast where we talk all about the courses in depth or the stages in depth. But, mm -hmm. um, one of the stages is either six or seven. It's like slightly downhill and just like very small fluctuations on the elevation profile. And I was like, mm -hmm. that might be some, some coal roll in time for Nate, depending I'm on what the trail is like. myself for that last day. <laughs> and I'll take one of your VA <laughs> pain rings. And we'll do that. Uh, I've actually never been, so I've not done races because I'm scared like of like getting hurt, but I've never been not wanting to do a race because I don't feel like I'm, I have the fitness. This is the first time where I was pretty close to backing out of not coming to South Africa and finding someone else for Sophia. Uh, this is, I know you guys joke about it, but it's probably downright dangerous for me to do this race and I'm not kidding. I don't want a brain injury. So sure. That's, sure. The, that's the thing too. With Sophia, when we ride together, you were saying learning how to ride together. Like, what do you like? Okay. Here's what we should do. We haven't talked about this yet <laughs> on the descent, Sophia, if so, I've ridden with John and when John just goes like you're similar to John speed descending, right? Somewhere around there. Like if you and John descend, is that pretty close? I think so. Yeah. Probably I, at least slightly on, slower on my end, but yeah. On the races that we've done together, sometimes Sophia is faster on the descents, like not together, mm -hmm. but like racing the same courses. She's yeah, right there. So if I ride with John and John just takes off, I go slower because I have to pick my own lines and stuff. But if John goes like super smooth, I actually go a lot faster because he does all the lines. He does, he just breaks appropriately and that sort of stuff. And once we find that speed where you go, I'm going a little bit faster than Nate would alone but it's just a smooth, safe speed. And we do that over our 30 something hours of racing. We'll go a lot faster. Um, and then on the, the other thing that we need to think about Sophia is you are much smaller than me and there will be, what? <laughs> there are these, <laughs> what happens in mountain biking is you're, I'm a big guy. I'm like 186 pounds now going up little like steep things. I think when you're smaller and you're used to cross country racing, you'll hit those. But if you hit those a lot over me, there'll be 800 watt surges over and over and over. And as you all know, if you do a workout, um, there's like one like Ebbets, you're going sweet spot and you have those little surges that makes that ride so much harder. And you actually end up putting out less kilojoules for the hour, uh, which is our, the thing we want to do. And because we're not going to be, there's not gonna be so much tactics. It's, it's going to be a race of attrition, right? Mm -hmm. This is how much can, how much can people not drop off over days? If you do a, uh, try doing four 
hard trainer road workouts back to back, like four threshold workouts. That third and fourth one are going to be darn near impossible. But if you do four sweet spot workouts, you can probably nail each one of those. So we have to talk about, can we go to pacing right now for a second? Um, yeah. and how should we pace this? Because Sophia's like, we're racing. She's told me this already. We're racing flat out. She's a pro flat out every day. We're going for the win. I have a feeling like the first day it's the first day is about an hour. Um, I've done it where a one hour race, you go all the way in, you feel it for like three days, but yep. you do a one hour race and you go 95 or 94%. Like you can race after that. Mm-hmm. What I mean, are your all thoughts? Sophia, go. You know what it is? And I find this so interesting. Like after doing Epic Israel, when you're with a partner, your perception completely changes. And hmm. You might be going at a hundred percent, but it is not going to feel like a hundred percent because when you're suffering, like you're being held accountable to your partner that's there with you. And you're like, okay, like I need to hurt just a little bit more or like, you know, I, I know I'm hurting. So I tell my partner like, Hey, back off. Or like, there's a gap or, you know, all that communication, like, you know, in Epic Israel with Rose, I was like, I don't think I could finish this race by myself. There's no way in hell I could do this race, but with a partner, it's a hundred percent achievable just because you have somebody there with you. You're talking to someone, you're engaging. So for me, I think the first day is good to get a good starting spot for the next corrals uh, for the next day. But I think you're, it's, you were never both going to be going at a hundred percent. Like there's times that I'm going to be at a hundred percent and you're probably going to be at 80% because it's rolling terrain or it's flat or we're going a little bit downhill and then I'll switch on a climb and then you'll be pinned for a little bit, but then I will back off. So it's like, I think that we're not even, it actually is gonna be a huge advantage because when I get to recover, you're going hard. And when you're going hard, I get to recover. So I think, I actually think we're gonna do better than you Wait, expect. Did you just say when you're going hard, I get to recover? Well, when is this? <laughs> well, on the flats, on the flats. Like well, for so me- So when am I going hard that you get, to, oh, cause it's climbing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think, I think you're going to really surprise yourself. And I mm-hmm. think, I think we're going to have a good time. And I think, you know, it's going to be, we'll you got to take it stage, stage by stage, and then just keep the communication good, keep it positive. And, uh, our goal is to finish, you know, I don't want to, I don't want something yeah. to happen to me and you have to continue by yourself or vice versa, or for anybody for that to be the lone, what's it? It's a, like a cheetah or something, right? When your, yeah. your partner drops well, out. Yeah. Something like that. Mm. Mm-hmm. When you, Sophia. when you, d- when you go on and your partner has to DNF, you get like a different Jersey and they call you a cheetah, something like that. And like you start in the back or something. Is this right? Yeah. Or so that's Wrong? right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sophia, you're going to carry all of our, I think it make, this is the joke, but it's also true. It makes sense for you to carry all of our flat stuff and extra things because any weight <laughs> that we can take off my, um, bike. And also you say you don't like riding with a <laughs> bottle in your Jersey pocket. But is that possible? Because that's still like, what's a bottle? Two pounds? A yeah. full bottle? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, yeah. So pounds. if I just have. We'll, we'll figure it out. Trust okay. me. I, I am open to trying. Well, yeah. Can I you bring can up the tiny point? pounds off my bike though. Yeah. The weight uh, differential yeah. thing. It's breaking too. <clears throat> like if you're going on a descent and suddenly it's like, oh, quick stop. We got to turn left here. The trail turns. Sophia can stop on a dime compared to Nate. Uh, mm-hmm. Nate has more weight so he can give himself more traction, but if it's steeper, that means that Nate's weight's going to carry down that hill faster. So mm-hmm. like, that's another thing too, is like <clears throat> thinking about that, like with, I, I still don't know with our group, Brandon, who should lead. Like, what do, what do you think? Do you, should I lead? So I have a descending advantage. Mm-hmm. Should I lead down mm-hmm. the descents or is cause following is a totally unique skill. That's something that like Rob and Rousseau are probably in Sophia are really good at. Uh, cross country racers are uniquely good at following somebody, right? That's a skill mm-hmm. being able to ride close and being able to trust and being able to ride smoothly behind somebody is really hard. It's like, Brandon, do you want to lead on descents or should I lead on descents? So I think we have a bit of an interesting dynamic that, uh, I think it's going to be an advantage to be, to be perfectly honest, because you are a much better descender than me. And, um, I'm going to say this in the nicest way possible. I'm a much better climber than you. Um, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so, uh, w- one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I don't know if how feasible this is going to be, um, cause obviously it's a team race and you have to stay within two minutes of your partner 
too much, at all yeah. times. So there is a bit of license for a um, stronger climber to go ahead if there is a long climb. Um, and uh, I think that's going to work out nicely because I think uh, I was stalking your Strava recently and we did, there's a basically a 30 minute, 30 minute loop, a uh, dry pond loop um, where to the top of that, I was just about two minutes faster than you. And down to the bottom, you were about almost two minutes faster than me. So we were almost exactly the same if you average those, those things out. So I think there's definitely going to be opportunities for us to use that to our advantage, um, where I can take the descents and not have to try to push too hard. Um, and can take them a little bit easier. Whereas if I were trying to keep up with you, that would be, uh, mm. well, I mean, Nada said it's, it's easy following you and I have followed you before, but, uh, sometimes I think it'll be nicer to just be able to take it completely on my own. So you're thinking, well, yo-yo, like I would go ahead on the descent and then you'll catch me on the climb. The, the thing I'm worried about though, is that I'm not going to be descending at my normal pace, right? <clears throat> like I'll likely want to drop that down just because we're talking about an eight day stage race with longevity. And that will just happen because fatigue will settle mm -hmm. in later, but I probably won't have that same advantage. Don't, don't I'm a little it, worried guys. about separating. Nate, don't or, yeah. do it. Yeah. You're going to have, gonna if you have technical, same. yeah, you're going to issue a crash. You're going to have an issue. You're going to watch your partner. And then, yep. uh, John, you're going to make Brandon's descending a lot safer because John picks really good lines. If you just go smooth and Brandon gives you three or four bike lengths. So, you know, mm -hmm. not right on your wheel, like a cross country world cup race, but he gives yeah. that and everyone's going to be safer and you're going to be more likely to finish the race. What happens if John gets a flat on the climb and you guys get two minutes apart more than that. And there's a, there's a check at the top of the, of the mountain right. climb. That's a like great you're, point. You're now disqualified. Yeah. You're out of the race because you wanted to save like an extra minute over 35 hours. Uh, sure. Or so 20. It's actually, I think a penalty, not, not disqualified. But, okay. Uh, so you, so you get a, an, an hour penalty. Yeah. John Jeez. might need you. Wow. To... That's so... John, that is <laughs> a serious an penalty. penalty in the Tour de France. <laughs> the cycling world of melt. Yeah, yeah. But like, uh, Brandon, you can also push John on these climbs. For sure. Like if you're feeling, or he can hold on mm. to your Jersey, um, probably holding on to your Jersey would be a better thing for like John's technical to go one hand and rather than you go one hand, but that's a, that's mm -hmm. totally possible. That happens all the time. You watch the video pushing happens yeah. all the time. You know, yeah, and I think it depends too. I don't think like the, okay, I'm just going to go as hard as I can on the climb, but it could be, okay, we're, we're, you know, 500 feet from the top of the climb at one kilometer from the top of the climb. Okay. Let me, let me get out a little bit ahead on this, on this, uh, before this descent, um, or things like that. I, sure. I don't know. We haven't really figured it out. Uh, we probably should have ridden together. <laughs> the, it, it would need only... to be really. I'm sorry, you would need to be really strategic about doing that too, because looking at the course profiles, most of the courses do have a significant climb near the end, but not directly at the finish line. So if you mm -hmm. were to pull too far apart from each other, I think that gap could just kind of open up if you were not really careful about the pacing on that. And I think the only time that I would ever suggest leaving Nate would be when I know um, a K away from an aid and I'm like, give me all your bottles. I'm going to go and I'm going to fill up. So by the time that he gets there, I, he's not even stopping. I'm like, mm -hmm. we go like, you know, so I think mm -hmm. that's in my experience, that's like the only time that you want to separate from your partner, because even if you do get, you know, be able to crest the, like, why are you going to go do an extra harder effort that you don't have to, you know, like for sure. you, you need to save yourself for when, you know, Jonathan is going to be hurting and you're going to have to be pulling in the work or vice versa. So I think, I think our strategies are going to change very quickly. I think from at round stage three, we're going to be like, Oh, we thought we could do all of these things. And it's like, even the idea of having try to have Jonathan lead all the time, like a lot of the For times sure. it's not even going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. just cause you have other people playing a factor. So I think also, um, yep. Brandon ahead. might be better to just descending with clear track, right? Like it mm -hmm. just might be better. And, and I can follow, I can like buzz tire on a descent all day and I'm comfortable, you know? So, so that's no problem for me. So it might be better to do that. The, the, the other thing that I'm thinking of too, is if, if 
a teammate gets ahead and then it puts like, if Brandon's ahead of me and it puts pressure on me to make up the time on a descent, <clears throat> that's when I'm more likely to make a dumb mistake too. Right. Because all yeah. my, my, basically like my risk management and assessment will go out the window because I'll be prioritizing other things. So it, it seems we, like it'd be an interesting balance too, between kind of going for the best result you can on each stage and also playing that long game, knowing you have so many stages left to go and the attrition that's going to happen. Um, one thing you said, Sophia, earlier, it was kind of interesting to me too, that idea that when you're riding with a teammate, you can push yourself in most cases a little bit harder than you would on your own, but that could also be a dangerous thing. You know, if it's early in the race and you feel that obligation to go a little harder than you should, you could leave yourself pretty, pretty emptied out at the end of that day and then have nothing left over the coming days. So it seems like developing a really good, honest rapport within your team is just as important as being able to kind of motivate each other. Mm. I agree. Um, I had a good question on where are we sleeping? Because usually you sleep in tents. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. just want to bring up the fact that I'm a really great CEO and I got us all the <laughs> VIP package. <laughs> so Thank we you, get Nate. hotel rooms and massage and our little van driving us to and from the start. The one thing we're not sure about is food because we've heard some horror stories of people getting sick, either from colds or from food poisoning in the camp. I guess it's really hard to ever tell if it's food poisoning or not. Um, mm -hmm. so we're going to try to find food around us and hopefully we can pack some extra food that we can bring, or we might, um, we are in South Africa, we have an office there. We're gonna have an employee there that could also help us, uh, bring food to us if it's an issue. Um, mm -hmm. Robin Rousseau, do you guys know anything about that? If, are there restaurants on these places where we're going to, or where we're going to stay? Uh, yeah, so actually I had a look yesterday and I've, I've been to all the, the cool thing about Epic this year as well is there's no big transfers. Like there's a hour and a half transfer from Cape Town to the where day one starts in Sierras, but Sierras and Tolbach are close together. And then that's also really close to Wellington all within 40, I would say 40 minutes of each other. And you at least not, you're not in the complete nothingness. They, it, it is not big towns, but maybe half of Stellenbosch for a comparison. So there are definitely two or three decent restaurants in mm. each town um, so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be too much of an issue to get get hold of anything um, great yeah another question we had was tires i think we're who's on <laughs> aspens i think four of us are on aspens right i can't are you actually going to run them nate <clears throat> yeah I sophia think, said i, I think, had to i think aspens are will be great so I don't know what, what size are you guys running 2.25s or 2.4 2.25 for me exo uh sophia where are you I have both actually. So I got two okay. fours mounted, a set of wheels with noodles, one without, and then I have two backup sets of 2.25s. Hmm. And Brandon, what are you running? 2.25s. And John, you're running 2.24s with inserts or without inserts? 2.4s. Yeah. 2.4s with inserts. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just surprised you're running them because we had in our group chat, Nate, for a long time, I thought you were going to pick the specialized tires, which Oh, don't go there. <laughs> St statistically, <laughs> statistically this year, there were a lot of specialized flat tires at races that we saw, you know. But um, also, also in, in, I don't know if it's the right thing to say, but also in Epic history, if you look at the, the pro specialized teams and the, the mechanicals they've had from Kurt Harvey and Salsa and the top end pros, it's, it's cost them a lot. Not to say it's the tires, I don't know. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. I, think, that up there. I think what it is, is that specialized makes the really the s works tire that's mm -hmm. really lightweight and a lot of athletes Jeez. make the decision to save the weight but mm -hmm. then they end up getting penalized for it because they're just more susceptible to flats i think like the regular specialized tires are fine but if you're trying to save the weight it's just not yeah, yeah. it'd be like, like 170 EXO tpi comparison. yeah yeah 170 versus exo they're basically like their 170 tpi tires the if you mm -hmm. pick grid casing you're fine, probably. That's right? what I was so. going to run was grid casing. Yeah. But yeah. we're on the same tire. We're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah. What about other other equipment choices? What are you guys all running for bikes, um, for gearing, suspension setup, stuff like that? Jonathan, why don't, why don't you start? Yeah. Uh, run, I'm not doing anything unique, really, with my bike for this race at all. It's like same setup. I'm running the uh, sorry, the Epic um, and yeah, nothing unique on it. I'm, I am running the swap box and everything else that I usually would take off for like the cross country races that I typically do since this is a, we want to be able to fix or repairs or anything else. I'm going to have my chain breaker tool 
I'll have my multi-tool, I'll have my spare tube, the CO2s, the levers, the tire plugs, the tire boot. Um, I'll have all that stuff stashed in the little box on the frame, but I am going to, I'm not going to run a dropper, I think, but I'm bringing both just in case. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm pretty comfortable riding without a dropper on most stuff. Uh, if it gets really, really intense, like it's big drops or big, like vertical, gnarly, chunky stuff. I mean, really yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's when I want my dropper, but I don't think that's what we'll be. We're not riding any EWS courses this year in the Cape Epic. So I think we're fine. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my plan because I'll also need all the help I can get uh, against Brandon with higher watt KG, right? So being able to, to drop weight on my end to be able to, or will help. So I think that's the only unique thing I'm doing with it. And then I'm going to, for gearing, I'm bringing like 32, 34, and 36 tooth chain rings. I typically ride and race at the 36, but in this case, I think a 34 is probably a better choice. I don't know. Uh, we'll find out on next week's episode when we talk with Russo all about the course, but um, I'm going to bring all three of them. So then I have options to pick from. So, mm. and then I have Brandon, a 1050 on the back. I want the 1052, but if like you can get a 1052 cassette these days, like, oh man, you're, you're doing real well. They're hard to find. So. <laughs> Scarce times. Brandon, are you running similar setup to Jonathan? Yeah. With way less options. Uh, <laughs> I have, uh, I have an older Trek top fuel, um, kind of before they came out with the super caliber and everything like that. Um, with SRAM axis, uh, just a 34 tooth chain ring and a 1050, um, cassette. So that's kind of my, that's going to be the go-to. It's going to, what it's going to be. Uh, hopefully that'll work out. Yeah. And you're running Ross a dropper, right, Brandon? I am running a dropper. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Ross and Rob, how about you guys? What are you running? Um, so I'm on the Titan Cypher. Um, it's a hundred mole dual suspension. Um, so it's an African brand, so it's quite cool. Um, so the only thing I normally do for stage races or um, I generally run my suspension a little bit softer and my tires a little bit harder um, to rather not rather lose 10, 15 seconds on the descent than uh, puncture and lose five minutes. Uh, but yeah, I'd probably run a 36 or 38 and yeah, 1050, uh, yeah, 2.35 tires, nothing, nothing too special. 36. Rob? I, one, one, one quick question. Yeah. Running the 38, do you anticipate getting the situations where you'd be spinning out? Is that why you'd run that or just because you typically run a 36 or 38? To be um, honest, I, the... Sorry, go <laughs> Uh, no, I think uh, I'm used to riding a 36, so that's probably what I'll stick to. And I'm just taking the 38 along because I have one. And then there's one, I think stage four will be quite fast. So I might, might put it on for that. Um, but yeah. Cool. Uh, see how it goes. Rob, how about yeah. you? I was also, oh, well, I mean, we've got the same, same bike, same setup. Um, I'm not as a powerful puncher as or so maybe. So I think also like he's running a 36. I also run a 36 standard back home, but after being in Europe, I've kind of come to like my 34. And mm -hmm. to be honest, at world champs, I wish I had a 32. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the reason, or just to jump on um, what uh, Jonathan asked about 38 was, again, maybe it's a nerdy side. I like the tech side of cycling, but the 38 I found changes the kinematics of my suspension and it's, mm -hmm. you've got too much bump and it's you don't track properly with the ground which is not great so most bikes are designed around 34 so i stick to 34 36 and uh, yeah the only sort of other thing to save weight is instead of carrying all my kind of sharp plugging dyna plug kind of tools in my pockets i've got a south african brand as well that goes into the sides of your handlebars um so you can just pull it out and plug your tire instead of carrying it in your pocket nice nice Pockets off the food. And <laughs> Nate and Sophia, what are you guys on? Nate, go ahead. Uh, I'm on a 28. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> ten, <laughs> the 32. John, ten, did you buy me a 34 58? just in case? <laughs> I didn't get you a 34. I think I have a, uh, a an extra 34, though. Oh, actually, I think I have them all here, actually. Never mind. I got them. Uh, 32, oh. 32, 52. I don't see the case where it's going to be some kind of like 2% down. And I'm like spinning at 120, just wishing I had extra gears because 
it's 30 something mm -hmm. hours. Like I want, yeah. I'll just coast and like sit down and tuck and get that in. Um, and so that I save energy because if you're going that fast, you're going against wind resistance too. That's gonna be a great time to eat, drink and chill. Um, I'm not fit enough to just go all out the whole time. And I'd rather save it for a climb, which I will be limited on our group. Um, and you can still go like pretty fast with a 32, 10 on a flat, especially if you can, if you can spin it like 110, which I can pretty comfortably. Mm -hmm. Sophia's bringing I 38. <laughs> I think the 32 oh. will really help out for like, I think it's stage six, which is something like 85 Ks, 3000 meters or something. It's really ridiculous. Yeah. Stage, uh, five, stage, I think five. The, stage five, stage five, five. Yeah. Okay, yeah. stage five. Yeah. It's the climbing of Leadville, but just not as long, like yeah. distance. So yeah, but without the it's, flat sections, that's what you got. It's roughly ninety five hundred feet of climbing, and I think Sean, it's fifty eight miles. Is that right? Something like that. Um, um, it's a lot. Eighty five k, twenty nine hundred meters. I don't have the. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, fifty three miles in front of me. Ninety five hundred feet of climbing. So. Why? Without without Leadville's altitude, so there's that, but still oh, yeah, an absolutely level, so. brutal day. Yep. If you all didn't know, I'm pretty good at sea level, so we're, we're going to do well, Sophia. Check uh, that bingo ahead. box. Uh, I'm going to be running my specialized Epic. Um, Fox right now, they're servicing my suspension, so I am so thankful to them. Shout out to them. Um, they let me drop it off early this morning. I was like, hey, guys, I need a suspension service, so they're awesome. Um, I'll probably have a 34 on. The idea of changing a chain ring, it's, I don't think it's going to be something that I'm going to have the energy to do after a race. I think even just getting the bike to turn over and just to be ready to go by the next day. Um, we'll have mechanics for that, by the way. So oh, we do. We have oh, a mechanic we package. Mechanic package. Ooh, I did yeah. not know that. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I have my swap box. I have, you know, a bunch of spare spot, spare parts. So I think, yeah, it's going to be normal setup, but, um, yeah. yeah, pretty excited. So the people want to know who's waxing their chain for this. I am. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I I know, nobody else yet. <laughs> No, no, I have uh, five, six, I think I have seven wax chains, so I can just do a new one almost every day. Um, That's maybe I'll take the first one over. Wow. Yeah. Hey, do you have a, bad. do you have enough for the rest of us? Yeah. I, <laughs> I want to share one. Uh, chains are so six. hard. They're so hard to come by right now. Are they the SRAM chains, Nate, or do, are they yeah. different ones? They're the SRAM chains from uh, Ice Friction. Is that Ice okay. Friction, right? Yeah. yeah. They're super good. I've They're better at it than when I wax myself, and they're not even that expensive. And then you can also ship them back. So uh, mm -hmm. pretty well. dope. Pro tip that uh, I've heard that I cannot validate myself because I have not done it, <clears throat> but I've heard that the Campy 12-speed chain is actually more efficient than the SRAM chain on SRAM mountain bike drivetrains. And they, so I talked to that's been something that people have been using uh, i i don't want to blow anybody out but like very much top riders that we see have been using those so i, I talked to heard. ice friction about that and they're like that's not true use the eagle well while they may not say that i know that there are a lot of very notable teams that we see watching racing world cups that use them right now so who knows right they might be doing it on bad information is but the Scott good news Cannondale? is that <laughs> <laughs> Cannondale uses Shimano, so definitely not them. Um, okay. But yeah, I wonder. Uh, you we'll might be able to piece the, it together. So, but the interesting thing with this is that um, uh, right now you cannot get, like, they're extremely hard to find. I don't know if it's in South Africa, but here in the United States, you can't find that 12 speed mountain bike chain from SRAM. It's really, really hard. So, not many people uh, buy Campy, relatively speaking. So there's plenty of <laughs> chains in that regard. So you have an option to go with. Um, so I hear if your chain breaks, I hereby declare my, I, we need a lawyer or something to like devolve, dissolve me of responsibility, but yeah. Maybe it's um, just super clever Campy marketing. <laughs> <that's it. laughs> Make money on the chains, not the group sets. Yeah. That's where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. the same. <laughs> I have a goal for us. I think that's a good goal for us is that every day, in the results, we move up higher in the results. Like we don't get slower, we get faster compared to everyone else. Cause we're not going to drop off cause we're going to eat like maniacs and we're not going to sleep in tents. We're going to sleep like 10 hours every night and not have a bunch. Oh, that's another thing too. I stopped caffeine, uh, specifically for lots of reasons, but for this race, because 
I want a bigger jolt. So if you get, you know, you drink a lot of caffeine all the time, as you drink caffeine, it doesn't have the same impact as you, um, than if you don't drink any caffeine. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Peter Reed used to do is for Ironman where he wouldn't do it. And if you drink, if you have too much caffeine during a race, which I've done on big races, like 300 to 800 milligrams, like Leadville I think was 800, you cannot sleep that next night. And mm -hmm. even the time that it takes, the half-life of caffeine is long. So if you even have it all at like eight in the morning, you're still gonna have some caffeine in your body late at night. So I wanna do less caffeine in the morning, maybe have a emergency caffeine gel if like we're really, if I'm bonking and there's a huge issue. Um, but hopefully get a bounce from that. And then at night still be able to sleep because that's another thing is like these stages start at what, seven in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. So 7 a.m. start time. And yeah. uh, we're gonna have to get up then to eat what at like four, Sophia, what do you think? Four or five in the morning? Yeah, yeah. it depends how much food preparation we have to do, but yeah. And then we'll have our transfer from the hotel to the start. Mm -hmm. So I talked to Dr. Uh, Poch, look, can never Pochagar. Is that how I say his name? I can never say it. Um, in front of the Ligar. podcast, Pold yep. Poldegar, and he yep. is a PhD in um, exercise metabolism, extremely fast cyclist, about what you would do for this race to fuel. And he says, the most important thing, get your breakfast in. And then he says uh, about uh, 120 grams an hour or 110 grams an hour for me and then uh, of carbs on the bike. Make sure you get fructose. He was really important about that. Uh, he thinks that this is not proven yet in research, but uh, to have a good amount of fructose with your uh, other kind of glucose that you're eating in the morning, and then to hit two other meals of protein with your carbohydrates. And for me to get, or for all of us to get 10 grams of carbohydrates um, per kilogram of body weight per day. So that's like 860 of me, which I don't think will be a big issue if you eat a lot on the bike. And I've been yeah. testing this. So my training's gone down, but I can go long, like pretty easily now. I have no problem. So I, Sophia, I can't go really high, but I think I can hopefully maintain for a long time. And I've been testing 160 grams per hour Ooh. and it's been fine. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. It's, I just go, why, why not double it? But it, it's been good and I feel really good. And the next <laughs> day I feel not? good. And <laughs> <laughs> why not double it? Most people are like, oh, I'll work my way up. <laughs> <during the race>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, pretty... I'm, I'm shooting for like, but basically I'm allowing myself to take in 110 an hour if I take in everything as I should. Um, but I think that I'll probably end up because of using a hydration pack at different points in each stage, most likely, uh, it I'll probably use somewhere around like a hundred to 110. The one thing that I've found is that, um, as the day goes on longer, I was experimenting with like 120 to 130, And as the day goes on longer, I tend to get more gut distress at the end of the day if I'm taking in the whole time around 1.30. So because of this being like a cumulative stage race, I wanted to be in a spot where I know that I can take that in for five hours and be fine. Um, even though I think that, you know, for like a shorter race, and if it was a one-day race, I would take in a ton. And I'd be fine if my gut sucks after the race, right? Like if that's the case, who cares? It's a one-day race. But in this case, if I have gut distress after the stage, that means I'm not going to effectively absorb everything I need from the food I'm taking in after the race, which means I'm just going to be putting myself in a hole. So I'm trying to favor like a sustainable approach. I'm also, I usually mix my own, but I just made the decision yesterday to not mix my own and to instead go with the Marten stuff because I'm really worried about flying with 50 small Ziploc bags of white powder <laughs> through customs. And I feel like <laughs> that would just likely throw a flag that maybe might not get thrown when it's in like packaged stuff. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I do know is that my stomach works really well on that. Like I've already tested that. So it's not like I'm going in untested. Um, so, so Sophia, that's, what that's are you doing for food? Approach. I mean, I'm going to eat cliff bars, cliff shots, probably find some other sweet stuff, pick up bananas at the aid stations. I think for me, I'm pretty easy. I just got to eat every 30 minutes. Um, I am concerned about flavor fatigue on breakfast, like with the stages I've done, even it's real epic. Like I love pancakes. I eat them every morning, but then the last day I was just like, Oh, I got to eat this pancake. Like you just, so I think it's going to be important to kind of switch up breakfast, do some savory stuff, some sweet stuff, just to not have that flavor fatigue. Um, and then yeah, just hydration on my bottles. And yeah, I think 
I'm being a little too relaxed on this, I think, <laughs> but <You can> be. <laughs> I, I do, I do think it'd be really cool to get a scale and have us all weigh ourselves before the prologue, like day one. And then after day eight, cause I'm really curious to see how much body weight we're going to drop over the eight days, because there's no way you can in, intake the amount of carbs and food that you need to maintain your weight for over that long amount of time. So I'm yeah. curious how many pounds I'm going to lose. <laughs> Glycogen and dehydration would be huge too. That's, uh, yeah. Sophia, are you mm -hmm. going to have a hydration, hydration pack? I have, I brought, I'm bringing two. Um, we'll just see, you know, I can fit two water bottles on my bike. So I think. Do you have an extra long hose? <laughs> like... that, that can be how you hold on. on. <laughs> yeah. So I'm serious. If there's a you wearing an extra one if there's a, a long time, then giving it to me later would also be a good strategy for us. Those are all jokes, levels but this the, is true. Levels the watt kg a bit, right? Yeah, I mean, and a, a bit Brandon more. should be uh, carrying John's extra tools and stuff too, for sure, and all yeah. the spare parts. And Rob, yeah. are you are you a better climber than Rousseau? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing, right? Rob well, should be, be carrying honest, all the extra weight. That's something like that Sophia mentioned earlier that I'm also a bit scared of is like, or like you said, the, the weight difference. Um, Cause like I said, I've done pioneer, which is a similar race to Epic and I've, yeah, I kind of just inhale food, which is a problem. <laughs> um, especially in racing. Like I think I burn like, or generally to maintain weight for something like 7,000 calories a day. Um, so adding on, four hours of racing is going to be interesting so like mm. in previous races before i've kind of got sick of eating food because it's like i just i know the calories i have to to meet to sort of be in the right place for the next day and it's it's not that easy so that's kind of like i guess where yeah i'll be taking quite a bit of sort of recovery shakes as well just to bump it up a bit obviously that's not the main source of food but just to mm. kind of peace of mind that i've got that extra fuel for the next days especially protein going into a stage race protein is sort of recovering you for the next days and the next stages to come. So it's not for that, you know, it's like not, you don't need like it, like glycogen, you don't need it in the moment of the stage, but it's going to help you going to the rest of the stages. That's mm -hmm. a really good point. We talked about this is, uh, when we fly into Cape town, we're going to get whey protein. I don't know if we need a vegan or protein for you guys, but to have yeah, our group, me, to sure. have a couple big tubs of protein, just because it is, you can get so full on these races too. And, uh, um, eating like a piece of chicken or a steak can be extremely hard, but drinking mm -hmm. a protein shake is a lot easier. And we can also then have protein in recovery right after the stage race. And that's part of the service. We bought a bottle service thing, bottle service, woo, um, thing too. <laughs> <laughs> put in, uh, our carb, you know, the carbohydrates, but four to one, probably ratio of that. And, um, uh, and a whey protein or a vegan protein for John. And then we can chug that too. It, it's, that's also, again, what Dr. Uh, po Dr. Podligar. Podligar. Dr. P. I just want to mix them up with- uh, uh, Dr. Tim, with Pogacar, um, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. They're that's both what from I do. Slovenia, both extremely I fast. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's a great, that's a good real point that on a stage race to main that, maintain protein because we don't want to lose muscle mass inside of it. And what's also interesting is if we keep our protein up and we're in a caloric deficit, and we sleep enough, it is much more likely that we're gonna lose um, fat mass over those days rather than mm -hmm. muscle mass. And we're gonna need upper body and lower body muscle strength, muscle mass of yeah. being on the bike. Like being fatigued over that time will just kill you on your position and you're out of position and then you crash, um, which is really bad. Or you're just getting comfortable and the uncomfortableness gets into your head and then yeah. it's harder to put out watts. So it's, it's super important for us to maintain good nutrition to this whole thing. Just thinking about this in terms of like calories, which really, you really want to focus on replenishing carbohydrates and, and protein. Yeah. But carbohydrate is the main thing that you're consider or concerned with. Right. But just thinking of it in terms of calories to give everybody a point of scale, I think for me, it's probably going to be somewhere between seven and 8,000 calories that I would need to take in to finish around a zero during this stage race. Right. Like if you think about it, um, the calories that I'll be burning in the stages are probably somewhere. It's going to be close up to from the power meter, probably somewhere around 3,500 to 4,000. But then with mountain biking, you inherently burn more. And then you have that afterburn effect that we talked about on the podcast recently, where you end up, you like Nate said, that's where fat burn tends to happen too, and everything else. But your caloric burn is, is, is heightened after exercise, especially after something like we're doing there. 
And then if you think about basal metabolic rate and everything else, that's like about 10, like in the United States here, Chipotle, if you go to that, that's like 10 bowls of Chipotle that you'd have to eat every day to finish like, you know, at zeros. This is all mm -hmm. rough math, but that gives you a point of like a kind of a point of reference to understand how much food you actually have to eat. That it's not like, okay, small breakfast, take in some stuff on the bike, and then I'll just have a normal lunch and dinner thereafter. Like, no, like <laughs> eating is your job. Like you have to eat so much. And like you said, Sophia, it is tough. Like you'd get really tired of eating the same thing or even just tired of eating anything, but you have to get, you have to get it down the hatch, you know? Yeah. Guys, I am I, so I'm, screwed. <laughs> <laughs> we we believe that, in you, Nate. Nate, you can do it. <laughs> The uh, amount has of kilojoules per day, because I haven't been doing, I've been doing trainer rides, but not 4,000. I haven't hit a 4,000 kilojoule day in like, since probably Leadville or something like that. And yeah. just one of those days will impact me a lot. I'm sure. Mm. It's, yeah. It's not going to be no bueno. I no, did Sophia. a 30, <laughs> I did a 3,700 day on Saturday and I felt just fine. Like carried on. Dad life you, was uninterrupted thereafter. Thanks for telling it was, me. It, yeah, yeah. You know, just want you to feel good about yourself. But, um, but I was like, I was worried about the same thing. But um, honestly, and you know, the interesting thing is I haven't been doing a ton of long rides. I've been doing a lot of sustained work. Like my training's changed in that regard, in the sense that for XEO, I was like the longest I did was like 10 minute intervals, right? And I was doing everything from 10 minutes and shorter for that course. I was doing that for quite a while leading up to that. And now it's 20 and 30 minute intervals, like 15 to 30 minute intervals is what I was doing, whether it was, whether it was threshold or sweet spot or tempo, those are the workouts that I was getting with adaptive training, uh, following the, the grand Fondo plan basically is what I was following for that. So mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, it's interesting how that sort of stuff can prepare you to go long. So like you, you, maybe you're good though, Nate, you said you can go long as long as like the pace is not over the top, then you might be able to, yeah. you might be just fine. Yeah. Sophia, listen to that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia, everyone keeps telling me, not everyone as in John and Keegan have told me that <laughs> you might get spicy with me. Like, <laughs> do you think you'll be fiery competitor and might yell at me some or no, because our purpose has changed quite a bit. We went obviously coming in at first, we wanted to win co-ed. And I think now my goal is making sure that you make it through all eight days of racing and that you finish the race. Um, but good goal. I am known like I did in collegiate when I was at Fort Lewis college, I was part of our team time trial and you learn a lot about communication, especially when you're with four people. So I learned that if I'm at the back and I needed to tell someone at the front, something like I yell and I do it once and you're going to hear me rather than me try to say it like four times and then you not understanding what I say. Um, so I definitely have had to like watch my voice a little bit. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think I know we'll be fine. I You'll think. project. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I think like, you know, there's certain things that it's like, you know, you're going to have to yell at me when there's a, like when there's a gap between us, you know, especially going into a descent or like, if you want me, if you're feeling good and want me to go faster, you're going to have to yell up or down if you want me to slow down and me to you. And it's like, the, I think it's like the tone of the voice is more just so we're saying it once and it's understood rather than like me saying, did he say go faster when you said to go slower? And then I pick up the pace and then, um, yeah, I'm more of like a direct to the point mm. communicator uh, while we're at racing. But I think no, we'll be fine. I, I have we'll faith. be fine. Yeah, we're gonna have one a great time. We, one thing we didn't talk about at all with the nutrition stuff was electrolytes, like sodium replenishment. It's gonna how it says that it's going to be roughly, and these are Fahrenheit temperatures. So Robin Russo, you can give us the Celsius ones. But good to have you guys for that, by the way. Thank goodness, no more Google <laughs> Translate or, or convert going on. But um, it's gonna be roughly like seventy-five degrees for a high, and it looks like down into the low fifties for lows uh, Fahrenheit. So is it going to be colder than previous Cape Epics because of the time of year? I think it will be a bit cooler, yeah. Um, like March is generally, Feb, March is normally a really, really hot month. Um, so October, we're kind of just going out of winter. It's still fairly chilly in the morning. Um, it does heat up later, but it, I think it kind of stays cooler for long. The sun's still coming up a little bit later than what it would be in, in summer. 
So that makes a big difference. I think like you're only going to be in, depending on obviously how long you ride, but if we start at seven, then it really picks up from maybe off post nine, 10. So you've got like a good two, three hours of some very mild, just nice riding temperature. Um, so I think okay. that all definitely have an impact compared to Epic and March. Um, I'm just planning where, on five, yeah, 500 milligrams an hour for me is what I'm planning on taking in for sodium. I think so, something that also kind of plays into that is luckily as well this time of year and also the sort of where we're riding, where the stages are, the, the weather conditions, it's not that humid. So it does the humidity isn't that high. So it does, like humidity doesn't affect you as much as yeah other areas. Mm. Yeah. Nate, you, you're such a heavy sweater, like relatively speaking, you lose compared to uh, me at least, but you, you lose a ton of fluid and you also lose a lot of sodium. And that's like one big concern too, is on the stage race front, you may be fine on taking in, like you may be checking the box on carbs, but if you're dehydrated, it's really just so easy to get dehydrated too, you know? Yeah, that's a, so that's a good point, John. I have historically... I, I lose a little, like a liter an hour for, for cycling in hot conditions without a fan, uh, which I'll probably lose a little bit less when you have cooling with the airflow and stuff outside. But I've also done it where in races, I kind of, I, or in, a, in training, I end up the same weight as when I started. And that's yeah. probably overfueling, especially with glyc glycogen loss and too much drinking. You, you can lose some percent and like the rule of thumb is you don't want to lose more than 5%, but I can lose a couple pounds for sure in weight. And the question is, I don't want to have, so well, I guess it doesn't really matter. I just have Sophia carry extra pounds of water, um, as we start in order just to like end the stage, but there's also end the stage at a, at the same weight or more with hydration, but also this is a stage race and ending not in a deficit might help on the subsequent days. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also stopping to pee, which is a, I don't know, that's probably not a huge deal for us at all. Cause if we're goal is to finish, I guess we can stop to piece Sophia. Um, yeah. but, but, uh, it's all of those things. I I'm not sure. I think I'm going to start the first day with just bottles and try to use the, use the bottles. And as we stop at an aid station, chug an extra bottle and then use the, the bottles that we've given. So I get the right amount of carbohydrate. Um, and then from there we'll bring packs and we'll decide if we need to do extra stuff from there. But and then I'll so use you, the precision hydration, hundred milligram, a thousand milligrams in a bottle. So I'll get like that a, an hour, a thousand milligrams. You guys have the ability to have pre-prepared bottles that are waiting for you at the aid station. Is that something that is yes possible? But only two, and there's three aid stations. So that's what. So we get eight bottles of our own choosing per day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking with that, Brandon. We'll probably have to like, because uh, I don't want to carry a hydration pack if it's going to be a lot of climbing. So ideally I'd carry the hydration pack when there are, there's not as much climbing on the stage. Right. And then we'll have to basically say it. So if the stage starts out with a big climb, I don't want to carry a pack. Then we'll pick up the pack maybe later on. If that's even possible, do they do not that? Possible. No. So we would have to you start can, with our pack. Yeah. Um, what I think the rules are a little bit different for the UCI teams and they, I tried emailing them. They're not that too flexible about, uh, um, you know, like, when, not bending those, but like they're pretty strict. Like the rules are different for the UCI teams and the normal teams. Mm. But I know what Canada has always done in the past, or not always, 2019, that works quite well. They would pick up a duration pack, at water point two, and then ride with it for the middle of the stage and then drop it again, water point three. So you get that critical, that middle part of the stage where it's really important to drink. And then they finish off again with a small bottle, start with a small bottle and manage it like that. But yeah, you know, as far mm -hmm. as I know, you're only allowed with the, you can, you got the bottle service thing, but you're only allowed bottles. And I think you have to even like use their bottles that they yeah. provide. They're like quite, quite strict with that. So that means uh, that we're going to have to start with a pack. And then maybe what we'll do, Brandon, is not start with bottles or start with one bottle, <clears throat> depending on the stage. And then pick up the bottles later as we go through. Cause that's one thing. Like if you just every day, you're like full pack two big, you know, 700 or 650 milliliter bottles. That's a lot of weight that you're carrying uh, that might not be necessary, you know? Yeah. yeah. 
So one more thing I want to cover before we go into some rapid fire questions. And if folks who are watching on YouTube have any questions they want to ask, please leave those in the comments for us. Um, for, for those of us or those of you guys who are traveling, what about something like jet lag? How, how far in advance are you guys going to arrive? And do you think that's going to be a factor? Because especially coming from the Western or mountain time zones that you all are on, that's going to be a significant change in schedule for you all. So what, if any, strategies are you using to, to mitigate that? Sophia and I are flying business class. We're going to sleep and... Fucking <laughs> <laughs> eight. <laughs> He's not joking. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. John and Brandon. <laughs> hey, it's, a, it's all right. It's all right. We'll make it through. Um, uh, I don't... I, I, my same strategy that we usually use, and mm. if you go over to that time zone of just you stay up until you have to go to sleep, you just force yourself into that routine. Yeah. And we're, we go six yeah. days. Well, how many days ahead? Of, five days ahead, I think, when we land because of the... We leave on we Monday. Land Wednesday. And we land Wednesday. So we have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the race starts Sunday. So yep. kind of like five days, not enough to mm. fully adapt to the time change because the time difference is almost like 11 hours, right? Something like that. It's almost opposite. It's, it's, wow. you know, it's uh, like, you know, I think it's the same as Europe. I think they're just, yeah. you guys are just uh, one hour ahead, perhaps. Is that the case, Robin Rousseau? They're yeah. like France's and Italy's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. it's a lot. And what we'll do is I, I, I strongly agree too with like no caffeine because that will mess up your sleep schedule. And then mm -hmm. you can do melatonin. Um, but if you do melatonin, like it'll be, you can get a, um, a rebound effect. And then that's the worst is when you're, when you're traveling, you take like one of those five milligram doses, which is I think too much for this. And you go to sleep at nine and you wake up at three in the morning and you just cannot go back to sleep and you are wide awake. That's like the, that's not a good scenario. If you are going to do melatonin, I'll bring like a half a milligram that maybe just help me push back to sleep. But generally the other things, um, cool room, no screens, uh, sleep mask, earplugs, go to bed early. Uh, they help wake Ooh, up early have... too. That's yeah. key. Like I think with Keegan and I this year, every time we've gone to Europe or even when I went to Tokyo, it was you set your alarm for maybe the first day sleep till nine, but then every day after that, wake up at eight, just because otherwise you could easily sleep till 11 or noon. And then it's really hard to get adjusted. So I think you have to push through the first two days on an early morning, and then it'll actually speed up your whole adaptation process by a few days. You guys have the load sharing going on in Cape town right now or anywhere? Uh, um, no, no, it's, they've been quite good. Like we haven't had, uh, what is that? <laughs> Load sharing are like rolling brownouts <laughs> where it's planned oh, and you know when the electricity is yep. going to go out. And I sleep with a CPAP. And what happens when it goes out is I just choke because oh. it like, so I wake up uh, and that's not the best way to have sleep in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> Decidedly not. In a yeah. Situation. yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm happy to hear that's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Cool. Are we ready for rapid fire? Yeah. And there's one related to, I guess, that load sharing topic. Uh, does South Africa have charging points along the way for Nate's air fryer? And more importantly, <laughs> Nate, are you bringing the air fryer? No, but actually, so funny story. Oh. I think we're going to buy a rice cooker because yeah. if we have a rice mm. cooker, we're all going to be in a hotel. And if we buy a rice cooker and then a whole bunch of bags of rice and then some different sauces, that mm -hmm. can be a great like way for us just to all snack. And we can get some sweet stuff or some savory stuff, some peanut sauce some teriyaki, um, hopefully probably not anything spicy. Um, spicy yeah. can, with the amount of food that you're eating, there's another pro tip. I'm out of, well, I'm, I'm like the only non-pro person here. Uh, I guess Sean and I, uh, <laughs> this is a, I'm with uh, you. <laughs> is the, uh, when you eat this much food, acidity and spice can cause heartburn. And then when you get in that, that, have you guys ever had heartburn when you eat too much food? Yes. It's, you get hiccups are the first sign. And what happens is you just can't eat any food and then it can kind of ruin your race that way. So like tomatoes, um, like you gotta look at like pasta sauces and stuff like that. Um, coffee. I've had heartburn so bad that like cold water hurt me when trying to eat a bunch, any alcohol, of course, not good, but if we can do something plain, um, and not spicy sauces, that'll probably do a better job. Also low fiber and low fat. That's what, um, Dr. Pojagar said to me Dr. also P. is. Yes, <laughs> is low fiber. It does two things, um, easily to digest stuff, but also we won't carry as much fiber in our gut and we'll, you, you know, not have as much weight. 
Um, and then the low fat, just because we're going to be eating so much food, we're going to get our fat in. If you eat 10,000 or not 10,000, what do we say? 7,000 calories of food a day. You're yeah. going to get your minimum amount of fat that you need automatically. Um, that your body is going to perform well. You don't need to mm -hmm. then raise up on it and have like chicken wings and stuff like that, that are high fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really gives you more respect for, for grand tour athletes too. Thinking about the logistics of just planning nutrition for a seven day race. Uh, imagine a three week race. That's incredible. Well, they do nothing. That's actually easier. That's they true. just sit down and the chef goes <laughs> here and there's like a huge spread of all foods that are perfect for them. Uh, that sounds pretty good. I don't think we're going to have that luxury. Chef Hannah nice. Grant, maybe we can convince her. Uh, mm. She's going to be in South Africa by chance. <laughs> That'd yes. be awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Food related. Um, this is a rapid fire question. I'm going to mispronounce this, but are you guys keen for a lecker bori roll, which I take it is some sort of a South African uh, <laughs> local specialty. So maybe, maybe Ross or Rob can clear us up on what that is. 100%. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, a lacquer, we're sorry, I can probably pronounce it better. It's a uh, South African language Afrikaans, similar to Dutch. Uh, lacquer means like lacquer, really good. Um, and then Budavos roll is kind of like a South African, they want to call it a hot dog, like a sausage roll, uh, not sausage roll, but yeah, like a, a hot dog. Um, but it's traditional South African. We generally have it when we braai, which is like a South African word for barbecue. Um, it's far better than a barbecue. <laughs> it's the same um, thing as a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there will be plenty of time for a lack of burros roll. Hmm. Post race like sounds like too much food. fat mid. Yeah. Sounds like too much fat fat mid race. Give me some post race. <laughs> no, I think, I think it'll be definitely a good uh, post race meal. Ooh, mm. we get to see braai versus asado versus barbecue with this whole thing because Sophia's country is very proud of their barbecue as well. Their asado. So, yeah. and it's it's closer to American uh, grilling, not barbecue. Yeah. Barbecue being slow and low, long cook. This is more like wood. It's just a like wood, like you do it at a, a camping or something. You put wood up and sure. you cook stuff or charcoal. Yeah, bra sure. is pretty much open fire. Yeah. Nice. All right, next rapid fire question. And I'm going to even add a little addendum onto this one. Would you rather have to ride the race on a stock BMX bike or an upright comfort cruiser? Or I'll, I will add on Nate's Shami Hagar as a third option. If you had to pick <laughs> those three bikes, which would you choose and why? <laughs> Yeah, I'd pick the Hagar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for what sure. If, what if we remove the Hagar? Maybe that's an unfair option there. So <laughs> yeah. just the just the stock BMX bike or the upright comfort cruiser. Duh. None. I would, I would do BMX because it's easier to carry and I could just walk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good exactly. Point. You just walk either way. So yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, all right. Next up, what this is actually a really interesting question. What is the laundry plan? Will you be how many pairs of, of bibs and kits are you bringing? Are you going to be trying to wear a new pair each day? Is it going yeah. to be washed in between? That's that's a serious logistical concern. Can I take this concern. first? Yes. So I'm, I, this it might clue you in. I'm bringing eight derail your hangers for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and then, How many uh, stages are there? <laughs> I guess I only need seven. Oh, no, there's How many do you have one. in your pocket don't, each don't day? <laughs> yeah. 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 I should actually, we should actually, that's not a bad idea to have one on us. As we go, because oh yeah, we have the your late. Shimano though, right, Sophia? Yeah, so it, it, it still uses the SRAM Universal derailleur hanger, even though she uses oh, a Shimano drivetrain. Same. That's a great yep. idea because if we have a little teeny crash, that that could save us, and it's not hard to change that out. But I'm going to bring every train road kit that I have, enough that because uh, if I crash, like you crash and you've ruined bibs before, right? I don't want to ruin them and then be trying to find more stuff. But we also got the laundry service, which every day you can give them one kit in a bag and you get that back uh, later on. So I'll bring mm -hmm. extra gloves, um, but I'll try to wash the ones and I'll have backup gloves and stuff too if some of them get messed up. And I think everyone else, you are all limited by the amount of trainer road kits that we have, right? Everyone has, I think, three? Is that right? I have uh, three. Yeah. Had four. Yep. Then people Tulsa can't hear happens. you guys when you go like this, like when you nod your heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, everyone I'm... has three kits. I have Sophia's new kits right here next to me. So they came in uh, for Ooh. Sophia's trainer road kits. And nice. Yeah, that's the laundry yeah, service. I think we have how many 
different kits for me because we realized yeah, very late, late on that I didn't have jerseys. <laughs> and we had to hedge our bets there and go with a few different ones just in case because yeah. tech company turnarounds are, are notoriously tricky to nail. So yeah, I know Asos who sponsors the Cape Epic, they're also a sponsor of our team. They have their the jerseys arrived yesterday at seven, but nobody's at the office. So then they have to overnight them to me. Um, so oh, geez. <laughs> but then I don't know what you have. So I got lots of jerseys. Worst case, oh, you guys can fit a small, Ooh. look at that tiny thing. It looks, <laughs> it looks so small. <laughs> they, they, on the um, arms, they have like the, uh, the aerodynamic, like rivets, the, mm-hmm. oh yeah. Called. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. It's really nice too. And the man. The back yeah, is, if you're not yeah, if you're not watching cool. on YouTube, Nate just opened up a brand new uh, Trainer Road kit, and it is gleaming white. It is beautiful. Yeah, Fresh those white. are very small. That's another before and after photos. Just how not <laughs> white those go after <laughs> eight days. <laughs> yeah, they will lose that pretty fast. Yeah. All right, next rapid fire question: um, Do you guys plan on riding based on power data, feel, or a mix of both? Feel. All feel. <laughs> Nate, you look like you have an opinion on this. <laughs> what feeling are you going for, Sophia? <laughs> Yours. <laughs> uh, uh, why don't Why don't John and Brandon go? Because you guys are both. Uh, yeah. But you guys yeah. know power really well. What do you think? We're actually not like our power isn't far off. Like, relatively speaking, Brandon, what's your FTP set to right now? Three fifteen. And mine's set to 307, but I've been able to like like 30 minutes at 315 has been uh, and doing that three times has been possible. So mm-hmm. I think I'm probably around like similar power, but Brandon will just be faster going uphill, right? If he does that, so um, we might just be able to use my power data as kind of like a governor. But that said, it's still going to be like feel is the main thing that you can't transgress but we use power to try to figure out what that feel is. So then each of us can kind of lock in to where we need to be and have something that's guiding us. If that makes sure. sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of exactly what, what I was going to say that the power is going to be more of a governor and then purely based off feel otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause there might be some days where I might climb faster than Brandon and Brandon might be descending faster than me. Like it's just weird. The ebbs and flows you go through in a stage race. So that's why feel is so important. It, 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 it has to, but you can, that doesn't mean that you disregard power. Mm-hmm. That just means that you can calibrate power to a different feeling or whatever that might be that day. So mm-hmm. yeah. Ross and Rob, is that a similar way for you guys being that you guys are racing so much and you're, you're at the, you know, elite and pro level. Are you looking at your power meter often during a long mountain bike race? To be honest, I don't like looking at any data. <laughs> um, <laughs> the only data I kind of try to focus on is time purely just to 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 sort of know when to when to feed and when to eat but mm-hmm. regarding power i kind of i guess when you ride at the power limit long enough you kind of know what what you're sitting at of course it's not exact but you know yeah. okay i'm definitely if the the stage has got a long climb and end i shouldn't be going this hard here or there but then also it's dictated by the race because i mean if you're in the race it's it, it's often worth sitting in on the on on the lead group for a certain duration and suffering that bit more just to mm-hmm. get maybe a few more minutes on your competitors or your position. And so there's quite a lot of, yeah, won't be looking at power, but we'll be judging it by what happens in the race. Mm. Rousseau? Smart. Yeah, I would say, I think just, especially on the really, really long days, it's sometimes worth letting the race go and then knowing yourself and knowing, I can't ride like this for five hours going to tap off a little bit, keep on steady and finish strong rather than um, blowing up and losing half an hour um, Mm -hmm. because you're pedaling in squares. Um, (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, that's kind of my my theory on that, I think. Um, And everyone that I've spoken to in the past said, Epic, you're definitely going to have one bad day. So you must try and aim that you and your partner's bad day overlap because you're going to lose, you can lose a lot if today I have a bad day and Rob rides himself into the ground to try and get me to the finish as fast as possible. Now, yeah. tomorrow, two days after, he's, he's having a bad day and I'm feeling strong because of that. Like, so just kind of manage that effort and not do it, yeah, not overdo it. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, right within yourself. So uh, this might be a surprise to some, but I am going to be looking at my power meter. And <laughs> this, is, this is the strategy. Um, you use the, I have Garmin, and you put in the route, and they have a feature called Climb Pro. And it's very hard to remember how long all these climbs are. And you hit like a little hill and you don't know. So when Sophia and I hit a climb and it says the elevation of what's coming up and how much longer you have on it, if it's a 400 foot climb versus a 2000 foot climb, that's going to be a different pacing that you want to do. And how many times have you looked at your Strava file or your train road file afterwards, and you see that your power goes down the whole climb, right? You started high and then you just, you, it was too high for that effort, the length of it. And you just keep dropping, 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 dropping the faster way to do it. And the better way to do it over a mini stage race is to evenly pace that climb where you're not going as far above threshold or, or, or better that you kind of maintain that same power. And I kind of know those, um, that amount of power that I can do, and it's going to go down as a stage race goes on, but I can set the talk to Sophia, what the kind of the, the pace is and set it. And I think too, if it's not a technical climb, Sophia, and there's not a headwind, some of these things, me going in front might make sense. Um, so that I just pace my own self up and, uh, then you can also push me if you want to, or anything like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. on the first day though, will not be that there'll be a little bit where I'll just check the power meter to make sure they'll be, we'll be so excited. And I've ridden, um, the course, like besides plum pudding, cause I wrote it backwards. It there's steep stuff and, um, very easy for, to start out at 480 Watts, right. Going up the first climb, uh, when you, you should look down and go a little bit less. I um, never go out too hard. So that, that won't be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, John does that every single time. And then John, if he doesn't go out, like he just barely goes off too hard. He's like, I didn't go out hard enough. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it goes back and forth. Um, and I think too, Sophia, I just did, I did a, I think I did like 360 some, 365 or something for 15 minutes on a climb here, um, mountain biking. And it was like undulating. So that's, I'm not as slow as I'm making out to be, but I'm just not as fast and fit where I was in January. I was like pretty good in January. We were going to kill it in January, um, mm. but then the race got pushed, um, but w- we could be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to be watching, I think heart rate data quite a bit. And then I also do mm. have on my heart rate strap, the little core body temperature device as well. Um, you know, the temperatures aren't going to be that crazy because we're racing, you know, so much later in the year, but I think it's just another good data point to have. And, um, you know, I think for me, the power is going to be more of like knowing, okay, when I'm riding at, you know, 230, this is kind of like Nate's point or like, oh, I could, you know, have to go up or down. Uh, but I think it's so much more by feel and just communication with your partner and making sure that you cohesively is are moving as fast as possible. So mm, for sure, just, I'm going to open up a can of worms, John, oh. a can of worms, just the message yeah. me. Um, and I think I, I'll say too, if this is legal. But I've been using the Super <laughs> Sapiens um, uh, glucose monitor as in yeah. training, and I yeah. believe it's illegal for UCI pros, but legal for everybody else. So I was going to ask think, the race official. I think it's, in, it's legal in training, but not in racing. For everybody, or just for pros? No, I just think, UCI. Mm-hmm. Yeah, last last I read, yeah, for UCI, it's it's legal in training, but not in racing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask the the head coach whenever we check in, it, can I use this during the race? But what we can do, it, what it does is it gives you every minute you know your blood glucose. And there's certain areas that like ranges that you, that are optimal for training. And I've been using this and that's why I went to double the amount of, um, of carbs per hour, because I was watching my glucose when on a, on a long, um, threshold effort, it would just go down, 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 down. And as it goes down, your RP goes up, 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 and then I could eat more and it did not go down as much. So that is also something, um, I've also noticed it where I, if I bonk, I see it be really low. And if I can stay ahead of that and I can display it on my Garmin while I'm racing, hopefully I can keep, you know, eating and keeping the glucose mm-hmm. up or just pay attention to it. Um, and, and also a funny thing on, we can do a whole longer thing when we have more experience on it. Uh, but I've gotten where I go too high of glucose and that is also extremely hard. And the way to get out of that is to do like a really hard effort and it, f- it almost Here's feels it like you, you want to stop. <laughs> yeah. You gotta like burn it out really fast. It's crazy. So if it gets too high, um, uh, I might want to tell Sophia, we need to gun it right now or else I'm going to feel really, <laughs> yeah. really bad. Um, and the insulin comes in and then you kind of crash after that. That's why I got to 120 to 130. So with the same, using it too. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's why I, but the biggest thing that I've noticed is just constant feeling is so much better than taking in. And it's not like eating a, uh, eating like food in some big batch it's uh, and versus eating it in small batches. It's much like you can see that your blood sugar levels are much less volatile. They're much more consistent and the same thing on the bike. So it just makes for a much more consistent ability to perform when you are constantly taking in uh, uh, sugar. It's kind of made me question the whole concept of like how I would just take in an entire bottle of carbs in the feed zone in an XCO race and just like chug that bottle and then go. And then, cause that creates, and I've replicated that with a sensor and that creates me going up and down and up and down. Whereas if I just drink it throughout the race, which is tricky in a mountain bike race, but if I do, it's better. That's why we have packs though. Packs make it easy. Yeah. It also takes a while for it to impact your blood glucose, right, John? I would say yeah. when I do it, like 20 minutes about? It, for me, it's 20 minutes if I'm in a sedentary state to an active state. If I'm riding, it takes, and so after the initial warm up, then if I'm like halfway through my workout and I take something, it takes two to five minutes for me to see the change. So it's all, I think it's very individually relative to, like it, I bet there's a lot of, uh, and it depends on what you eat. If I take in fructose, it goes not as high, but it makes it more sustainable, which is interesting. So I get like longer extended elevated periods of it. But actually, um, Nate, you may have not noticed since you've been, you've been focusing on other things, but last week we did a full deep dive on this very much thing with, with Chad, um, where I only like loosely shared my experiences with it, but yeah, it's, it's going to be helpful. I'm going to be using it. I, I think that, we, sh we should say oh, this, I would say this too, that um, they're not available in the U S we actually had as a legal, we're part know. of a beta testing program. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. not only, I was going to say I had someone else bring them into the U S for me. And then afterwards <laughs> we contact the company and they are giving us free ones, John and I to try it out sure. and other people. Yep. So just, but they're not giving us money, but I will transparency. share our experience. Yeah. We're just cool. nerds that want data. Um, I think that the main takeaway with this though, though, on like the power discussion and everything else is that it is all going to be like, like it will change day to day. Um, yeah. it might not, uh, but it, it might change day to day and, but power informs perception. Right. And, and like Nate said, it can be a really good tool to be able to use. I, I wonder if we're going to get routes though. They still haven't released routes only for the prologue. I'm I want those routes that. so badly. <laughs> <I'm working laughs> Thank you. That. So <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, we should, we should get some, maybe not all of them, but at least the, like the, it's also time to that Sierra Stolbach, those ones and the Wellington ones. There's like one or two that are being difficult, but uh, okay. I know a couple of people that's actually gone out and done the route with the people that set them out. As, as long as official, they send you the right way. Um. <laughs> yeah, it might no, change on race day. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't trust it as my navigation. I'd follow the boards, but just for just for kind of general for climb pro. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <exactly>. mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Cause that's like yeah. a, that, that would be a really, we have the prologue. That's it. I tried to, I tried to use trail forks, just like reading their description and that was impossible to try to piece things together. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure what it'll yeah. be. But back to the data. I think that's going to be one, a third thing along with, you know, the, the body weight and the kits um, just to look at at the end of the race to see that trend from day to day. Cause I guess, Nobody's going to get faster as the race goes on, but I think it's the team that probably stays most, well, maybe Nate will get faster. <laughs> the, the team that stays the most consistent is probably going to be the one that has just paced things best overall. If we're looking at that power data across the this, course of the race. This sounds funny, but the amount of mountain biking I'm going to do on this race is a lot for me. And we could get faster, <laughs> Sophia, on descents as I get better and stuff. I, after the first, yeah. after stage one, I'll like, yeah. I think I'll get, you, I'll get into this. You're going to be so fast in like two or three weeks. Imagine if there was another Cape Epic a month from now, you guys would kill it. Actually, we should talk about that. Like, cause nope. Rob, you just did marathon world championships, which I think is going to take mm. you six years to recover from. And everybody that did that race, <laughs> cause that looked so miserable. Um, I don't know where, where Rousseau is everything else, but I like, I had plans of two weeks ago, having like a really big loading week and life stress threw me curveballs, and I just couldn't train like I wanted to. And then I tried to train thereafter and like really kind of almost like panic and make up for it with adaptive mm -hmm. training. It was like, here's your next workout. And I was like, no, I want a stretch workout. I don't want the, the, the achievable or productive workouts. And I couldn't finish them. And I was like, ah, oh, well, I'll just pack it in and I'll just take recovery. I don't have to worry about being the fastest thing in the world going into this. And in fact, I want to be more fresh. So like right now I feel really 
from a training stress perspective, super fresh and like ready. And like, I don't have a lot on me right now. Um, it's kind of like the place I want to be. Brandon, how do you feel? Uh, you like, we, we have a lot of stuff we're working on at work. So there's a bunch of work stress, <laughs> but yeah. So this one's, this one's been a little bit interesting because the, the fact we're leaving the, the Monday before has, um, I've had to fight that urge to be like, oh, we're training towards the Monday before when really it's another week after that mm -hmm. until we even start the race. So, um, I've really been trying to stay on top of still having a few hard workout days during the week. Um, but that has gotten more and more difficult as we've gotten closer to this, uh, this event, because there is, uh, there's a ton of preparation and, uh, additional stress that go into trying to plan for this. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Are you guys, uh, Rob and Rousseau, do you guys feel fresh or do you feel tired? Um, to be um, honest, after Marathon Worlds, um, I was, it, it took me a bit longer to, to turn the watts again that I felt I was comfortable at, like psychologically as well. I was a bit like, this isn't great, but like more and more now I'm kind of, especially yesterday after I did some efforts, I was like kind of back to that point of kind of like super stoked and like hit the watts, felt good, like. And then I'm just sort of maintaining that and then taking it easy into Epic for a taper week. And then, then all systems go, I hope. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I've had, I'm actually still doing a race this weekend. Uh, uh one of the local marathons. Um, so I think that'll be a nice final last little three hour, um, suffer. <laughs> and then after that, I'll probably take it. Yeah. You know, just, take it easy um, going into epic but yeah mm. but i wouldn't say i'm like overly trained or anything i had a quite an easy week last week so mm -hmm. like kind of little little sharpening up this week and then the race and then going into epic so i think we got the got the timing pretty good Sophia, Sophia, how do you feel me i'm good now i like i said i crashed at the Pikes Peak Apex on the last day and I had to get five stitches on my kneecap, which wasn't a big deal, but when it's to stitches on a joint, you cannot move. So I yeah. limped for about a week and um, I got him out Sunday. Monday was a little painful to ride. And then now I'm fine, but I did have to get a bunch of body work done just because my right side of my body, since I was limping, everything was super tight. So um, mm. I'm in California now, I race sea otter on Saturday and Sunday. So kind of hoping, kind of training through that. And then, uh, yeah, we fly out at 8 p.m. out of San Francisco on Monday. So it's, um, yeah, it's coming really quick. Cool. Meet your fresh as Daisy, right? Freshness is um, high. <laughs> well, I haven't been sleeping. So like I would, I would say I'm not fresh. But, okay. But yeah. Um, so fitness is low. Freshness is low but Correct. only up from here. <laughs> <laughs> I got Sophia as my teammate. Ever though, the so optimist. Got that going for me. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. Nice. Should we do uh, predictions, Sean? Yeah, I think that is a great place to round things out. So I want to hear, you know, we're going to check in with you guys every day. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to hear pre-race predictions from where you're sitting right now, not just about yourself and your teammate, but the other teams uh, where you think this thing's going to shake out. So why don't we, Jonathan, we'll start with you and Brandon. I sign your paychecks just so you guys know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brandon, so I, I think we probably agree on who's going to be first here. Yes. Oh, yeah, easy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we all agree. Robin Rousseau, have fun up in that A group. You're going to do fantastic. Uh, we'll <laughs> cheer for you guys from way behind, I'm sure. Um, but I, I think that it will actually be closer than than people might think between uh, Nate, Sophia, Brandon, and I, I know that like the numbers may not show that, but I suspect that Brandon and I will just make mistakes and who knows Nate and Sophia might also make mistakes, but that very well could even it out between us, but I don't think it's going to be close. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe close early on, but, uh, yeah. I'd say the middle to from the middle of the race on it's, it's not going to be close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Brandon and Sophia, what do you guys think? <laughs> Sophia, you want to go first? I mean, I think it's a stage race and anything can happen, honestly. I think yeah. 
you can crash, break your bike. You can, you know, get stitches on your kneecap and then you can't pedal. Like, you know what I mean? You can make all the predictions you want, but even sometimes the most favorite teams still have bad days. And, um, yep. I think, I think going in that with an expectation of just finishing like goal number one, like let's get through every stage and just finish and then just kind of see where everybody kind of lands. But I think, you know, the more positive that we all stay, the better the morale is going to be. And then the faster we're all going to be. And, you know, thank you to Nate for getting us, you know, the nice hotel, the food service, you know, I think all those things are going to help us actually be able to, um, you know, have a great experience and then put down some good times. And um, yeah, I mean, it's eight days in South Africa. I think it's going to be super fun. So Mm -hmm. She says that because her partner is a one whopper kilo slower than her. They're going to be like, gonna like look at animals and stuff. And yeah. So Robert Rousseau, you're going to kill it. Do the trainer own yeah. name proud. I'm happy for you guys to be there. Uh, John and Brandon, I think what will happen is you guys will actually, the opposite of what Brandon says, you're going to start out with a bigger gap. And then you guys will, will you, you two are so competitive when you race. You two are different people. Uh, <laughs> if there is anyone that you see, you guys will be going as hard as you possibly can to do it. And the, the Brandon knows this, and he's got John to help him with. But historically, Brandon's had problems eating on long races. Hmm. Right, Brandon? Long single-day races, not stage races. How many? Okay, so you're good at eating in a stage race, just not in a single day. Exactly, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll see how that goes out. But if yep. he does not eat a bunch, he could he could bonk and stuff and have an issue. Um, Sophia and I, I don't know if Sophia can, but I can. It doesn't really matter. Sophia can lose a whopper kilo. She doesn't need to eat this whole time. She's going keto. Uh, <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> I'm just joking. Um, I can. That's the one thing that I can probably do better than anyone here is I can eat a lot, and that is very important on a stage race. I can eat on the bike and afterwards, mm-hmm. and I can uh, hopefully I'll be able to sleep too. So um, I think. For us, it'll, I think it will be enjoyable. There'll be a couple crashes, but hopefully nothing too big. And then uh, I think we will end up, I'm going to say 12th overall in the GC and the co-ed. And we're going Are to- Are we going to win but, a stage? No. The, the Starks <laughs> won every single stage. It's literally like you and Keegan racing with Keegan pushing you. That's how fast they are. Uh, the, the, he's like six watts per kilo, the other guy. Uh, yeah. I call that cheating. Day. Come on. You're a strong, independent young woman. Like you can pedal your own bike. Come on. I thought about that. I was like, I didn't work with sponsors, but I was, I was like, if I go out, I wonder if I could get Keegan down there just to like beat them. <laughs> well, he thought door. he considered. Yeah, I think I'm fine sharing this, but um, I, also on the last day of Colorado Springs, the Pikes Peak Apex race, um, Lachlan Morton and Alex Howes were there. They were going to do Cape Epic, and Alex Howes broke his pinky. And then Lachlan kind of threw it out there to Keegan, like, are you interested in doing Cape Epic? But I think they just had way too many conflicting sponsors and it just wasn't going to line up. But he uh, he considered coming, so I thought that was interesting. That would have been cool. We should say, too, John, we're going to be staying before in Sea Point, like the Bantry Bay Sea Point area in Cape Town. And I think we're going to do some road rides on our mountain bike, uh, sure. correct, to, to like... Yeah do in the morning and if people want to join us are we going to post that or should we do yeah, by ourselves we'll or? post that um it's probably best to stay tuned to uh our personal instagram channels or the trainer road forum for both of those things so you can find all of us on instagram if you just search for our names you can also find it in the description below but i think that's probably the best way to do it it'd be great to meet some of you and ride with you and i've gotten that question a lot if people are asking if we're going to be doing any rides beforehand so yeah we'd love to um it is so I- beautiful where we're yeah. going to ride. Like we, we could put it on the trainer road about, Instagram right? too. Sorry, Nate. Just awesome. Um, okay. We could put it on the stories on there too. Yeah. Cool. Robert. So you know where that is, right? Where we're going to ride. It's like a famous. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. But, really, really it's, cool. It's like one of the best in the world. It is so cool. I, I realized yeah. Brandon and I suck the predictions. We should get specific. So Rob and Rousseau are going to get, actually, this is, this is just overall time. They're going to be top 15, I think over the, out of the whole entire field. Um, how, so, how big is the field? I think they're doing 300 teams this year. Is that correct? Okay. But the top yeah. 15 includes like Nino and yeah. Yeah. And no like Nino. The, yeah. No yeah. Nino. There's no Nino actually, this year. The, no the elite Nino. field is lacking 
but it makes really? sense because good luck racing at Cape Epic in October and then back again in March. That would be way too too much. Yeah, I think the elite field's missing most of these sort of XC punches like Nino and those uh, Avancini, uh, or Avancini, yeah, uh, Manny's not riding, yeah. but there's quite a few, you know, from when I was at uh, in Alba for Marathon Worlds, quite a few of the European marathon teams are, are, are coming out. Most of them are racing this weekend in France and then they're coming up for Epic. So it's it's not as a pointy end, but I think the field's pretty, like, I won't say deep, but pretty consistent throughout. So mm. it's going to be awesome to watch 10. for something different. Robin and Rousseau are going to be top 10. Never mind. So uh, <laughs> top 10 overall. So I, can I change what I said earlier? There's actually some super strong teams. Uh, <laughs> <at least. laughs> uh, I think Brandon and I are going to be, our goal is going to be, we'll, we'll just say, if we can finish within top 40, that will be awesome. I think yeah, that I would be like say, a really good goal. Yeah, I was going to say top goal. 50. So I think that's, that's yeah. right there. How hilarious is it? Top 40 or top 50, like, like us making up like these, these benchmarks, <laughs> but I think that that's where, I think that's where if we can do a really well executed race, that's where we'd sit. Um, and that's like overall Nate and Sophia. I think that I don't, I just don't even know enough about the co-ed to actually put you in the spot. Yeah, this is how it goes. Um, in general, this is a generalization. The man is usually the faster person in the co-ed team where this one, there's obviously a big swap on it. So basically I need to compare myself against other, um, other women. Like, can I, do I usually beat other women in races? Um, there's you, the women pro field is usually one thing. Um, the, the Starks, they would have gotten like second in the women's pro field or something like behind <laughs> Amazing. Annika. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're at a whole wow. nother level. And then there are other people that were pretty close to them still that are very good with former, I don't know, formal pros on the team pretty much. But after that, it could be regular people, right? So women who are around 4.2, 4.5 watts per kilo, that's all pretty rare, I think, especially for a non-pro. So in there, that's why we could be top 12 or something because mm -hmm. that's where our like comparison is. But they could also be a lot faster than me downhill. Um, and who knows what's going to happen after many days and, and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Rob and Russo, you guys haven't ridden with everybody else here, but predictions just for your own, um, your own finish. Well, I was actually going to give a prediction on uh, Nate and Sophia. Um, oh, excellent. Because, like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I regret saying that. Um, but just like what Nate just mentioned, like the male in the sort of co-ed category being a bit stronger, but I think with the fact that you and Sophia are almost more matched, I think you might ride. I mean, if you're not slinging each other, like you said, some people do, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you might match each other far better. And I think like Sophia mentioned earlier, I think you could do well in surprising yourself especially in the co-ed field. Cool. Do it so Look at those guns. Nice play. <laughs> I'll lose them all. <laughs> awesome. Wow. This is happening. Yeah. I've, I've like hesitated even mentioning this thing because it, I was so worried that even just mentioning it would make it not happen. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. it has not started yet. Uh, uh, yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. I did not anticipate being excited for this race. Like, <laughs> It's so far from what I usually enjoy, and I am so excited for this. I cannot wait. But the funny uh, and thing the is, the race that itself is what I'm the most excited for. You know, I was so excited for it, and now I'm not looking forward to it at all. And John was like, <laughs> "I will never ever do this race. It sounds blah 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 blah." And now he is probably the most excited of anybody here doing it about it, yeah. about racing it. Mm. I'm super excited. Well, well, run on my excitement. There's plenty of it. You can borrow. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank it's you. There for yeah. you. <laughs> all, all of us that aren't racing are certainly excited to see how things go. And especially those of us that have listened to the podcast for a long time. I feel like you all have been talking about this for literally, what, two or three years now. So it's amazing to see it actually finally come to fruition. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, so during, during the podcast, we're going to, or during the race, excuse me, we're going to have daily updates on the prog the progress of each team. Um, so each of you, each of you teams will send me a little video update on how things are going and I'll recap the course and we'll hear from you every day. So really excited about that. And we think those are going to drop at about noon Eastern on, uh, on YouTube and all the podcast apps. And then next week on Thursday, the 14th, uh, Jonathan Russo and I, we're going to do a full course preview going through every stage, talking about logistics challenges hopefully you guys have course maps and routes by then uh, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we're gonna try <laughs> yep 
So yeah, super excited. I, I can't wait to see how this goes and folks at home can keep up. We're going to have blog posts going up on uh, the blog on trainerroad.com. We're going to have stuff posted on Instagram and all the social media channels. So you're not going to be able to avoid it. And I'm, I'm really excited to see how things play out. Hopefully everybody makes it through safe and sound and just has a good time. It'd be awesome. Yep. Nate, okay. you're going to do better than you think. <laughs> yeah, I think you're gonna ride into it. Like it's gonna, uh, you know, finish strong. I think that's the that's the the way to go. Yeah, um, I like the idea of just yeah. like we'll do like nine hour days and we'll do a stage win, Sophia, just so we can say we have a Cape Epic stage win. Like, <laughs> you're the boss. Awesome. You're the boss. <laughs> all right, awesome. thanks everybody. Appreciate it. And talk cool. to you all next week. Next week. Awesome. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Thanks everybody. Yeah,